Welcome to my switching routing and wireless essentials course. This should be the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is the second of three courses. Module 11, Switch Security Configuration. We're going to be looking at port security and we're going to be looking at ways to mitigate VLAN, DHCP, ARP, and SDP based attacks a little more in depth than we did in the previous lecture. So let's go ahead and jump right on in, implementing port security. Well, first thing is we should be securing all unused ports, meaning they should be turned off. If there's not a reason for them to be on, you can do an interface range and power all of them off. The fact that ports are left on presents one of the larger security risks. We can mitigate a lot of common types of MAC address table attacks by not allowing the, the device on the network. So by limiting the number of permitted MAC addresses on a port, we can actually help mitigate these types of attacks. And we can do this through port security. Port security is used to control authorized access to the network via MAC addresses. How do we enable port security? Well, we have to go to a statically assigned interface, meaning Let's say interface uh, fast ethernet 01. We have to hard code it to be an access port, at least uh, in this course. In the, the higher level courses, you can do uh, this on trunk ports, but again, outside the scope. So what we're gonna end up doing is go to the interface, hard code it to a access mode. From there, we're gonna do switch port tax security. Port security actually enables that function, but it has to be in switch port mode and it has to be set to an access uh, port. There are options for our, uh, port security. Here you'll notice we have, is it turned on? What is the status and what is the violation mode? Those are two big things we need to talk about. We also have an uh, aging section and we have a max MAC address section, meaning how many MAC addresses can it learn? So again, when we're looking at this output, notice port security is enabled, notice the violation mode, and notice the MAC address maximum option. If an active port is configured with port security command, more uh, than one device is connected to that port, the port will transition to an error disabled state if uh, that MAC address is not known. So some of the options we have. So we're gonna have to talk about things like aging and MAC uh, addressing and maximum and violation. Each of these portions actually define how port security is going to function. And uh, they're very important, so we have to cover each of those criteria. All right, so limiting and learning MAC addresses. So what we're gonna have to do is if we want to define how many MAC addresses it, uh, that port can learn, we would issue underneath that interface, switch port mode, sorry, not switch port mode, <laughs> used to be landing, switch port space port tax security space maximum space and a value. The default value is one, and you can have between one and 8,192 possible MAC addresses learned. Normally, I've seen this set to three or five, uh, normally less than 10 uh, MAC addresses. And again, this is the maximum amount of addresses it can learn. So the next question is, how can they learn addresses? There are three main ways. The first way is manually configuring it. And you do that by issuing a switch port, port security, MAC address, command and at the very end let me grab my pen this is where you type the mac address so you basically say this is the mac address that you know about there you go you can also dynamically learn addresses by uh, just turning on switch port security so when switch port security uh, command is entered the current source mac address of the device connected to the port is automatically secured and is not added to the running configuration. 
If the switch is rebooted, the, I'll have to relearn that MAC address. The important part is it's not in the running config. That means when we do our lab for this and we configure it, you may encounter the MAC address not actually being configured. What you have to do is, uh, the third way, is use a sticky. Basically, when the administrator enables the switch to dynamically learn an address, you have to stick them to the running configuration by using the switch port mode security MAC address sticky command. And then saving the running configuration will commit the dynamically learned MAC address to memory. If you do not do sticky and then save the running config, then this will not function and you will notice an error uh, when verifying it. I'm going to point this out in the lab so we can see how that functions. So again, this is how we'd be doing it on the right hand side. Left hand side, my right hand side. Setting it to access mode, turning on port security, setting the maximum number if you want, statically setting up a MAC address, and then applying sticky. That way sticky says relearn that MAC address. Uh, Sticky would also take whatever MAC address is currently plugged in and we'll learn that as well. How can we verify? We can do this by doing a show port security or show port security interface and give it the interface. That way we can see the status. We can see if uh, port security is enabled, the status, violation mode, and if the time different timers. We can also see total MAC addresses uh, that are configured and maximum MAC addresses. Maximum MAC addresses. So again, we're going to go through this in our lab, but I wanted to show what this would look like. So one of the things that was discussed was aging. Port security aging can be used to set the aging time for both st uh, static and dynamically uh, secured addresses to, to keep. There are two main types, absolute or inactive. The absolute basically means that that secured address on that port are, will be deleted after X amount of age time. Inactive basically says on the port and delete if it's inactive for X amount of time. That way they're not always hard coded, but you can set so that if, you know, a computer is idle for, you know, a hundred minutes, then delete it. That way you can allow a new timer to come on. So using aging to remove secured MAC addresses on the switch port without manually deleting the existence uh, secured MAC addresses, uh, some benefits. However, managing the, a large network, this becomes a little more cumbersome, but it all depends on the appropriate policies. However, aging on statically configured static addresses can enable or disable per port, which we already knew that. The timing is the important part. If we know what we're trying to accomplish and we do the appropriate timing, then we can actually lessen the security risk. Not saying completely remove it or mitigate it, but we can lessen it. How do we set our aging timer? Well, we'd go to the interface, switch port, port security, aging, and we can either do a static or a time. Uh, with that, uh, we could do time either based off of the absolute time or the inactivity time. And from there, we can actually see what we're trying to accomplish. So for example, here we have a aging of 10 minutes of inactivity. So we set the time and then we set the type. And you can see that here, aging, time, 10 minutes, type, inactive. And what will end up happening is you can now see the age time and age type being modified. It's now 10 minutes in inactivity. So what about these different types of violation modes? Violation modes come in three main flavors. Shutdown, that's the default. Restrict or protect. So basically what happens is if uh, a MAC address that is not configured is plugged in. The port will transition to an error disabled state immediately and it turns off the port. 
you actually have to go back into the port and re-enable it. Uh, issue a shutdown and then issue a no shutdown and turn that port back on. So the issue with that is if I, I'm working and I have two laptops and I have one laptop that's appropriate and one laptop that's not appropriate. One that has a Mac that's learned, one that doesn't. I plug my laptop into that port not realizing it's the wrong company. So that MAC address does create a violation so that port's an error disabled uh, status. Well, if I unplug it and I plug back in the laptop that is allowed, what happens? Well, with shutdown mode, that port's shut down. It's no longer listening. It's no longer accepting anything. So that's the, the negative with that. If we set the mode to restrictive, to restricted, basically restricted will drop the packets or frames for the unknown MAC address until that MAC address is learned or allowed on that network. That way, in the example I just gave with the two laptops, if I plug into a restricted port, then it will drop the packets from one laptop. When I plug in the correct laptop, the correct MAC address, it will continue to process that as if there are no issues. Lastly is protected. Protected is the least secure mode. And again, basically it does the same thing as restricted, except it doesn't log anything. With restricted, it logs. It logs the violation, it logs the violation counter, uh, it also generates system log messages and so forth. So error disabled state basically is the state that uh, shut down and it turns off the port. I, I brought that up because we have to go over the different states. Here we have an example. We can do a show uh, port security interface if we wanted to. We've set the violation mode to restrict. And we can now see that it's restricted. If there is a violation, we can see that it's going to transfer to a secure shutdown instead of a error disable state. So we've already talked about error disable and this is when the port is placed in an error disabled state and the traffic is allowed on it. The port protocol and link statuses are changed to down and the LED is also turned to down and this is the system log message that you should be uh, receiving. So we can also see that you can get a violation counter. So if the port is in uh, error disabled state, you can do show port security, navigate to that interface, you can see the counter. You should determine what caused the violation. And if it's a uh, false positive, you can do a shutdown and reshutdown command on that interface to turn it back on. With Port security, we can also do just a show port security, and we can see the ports, we can see the uh, max secure addresses, current addresses, violations, and action count uh, based off of a per port section. We can do a show port security interface and navigate to that interface for a little bit more detail. We can do a show run to verify as well. Here you're going to notice that we're doing a combination of sticky with a sticky MAC address. So it's not just sticky, we're doing sticky and a MAC address that's also acceptable. Here again we're doing show uh, port security, but we're adding the addresses. So it's no longer sorting the default show port security by port numbers, but we're now sorting it based off of addresses. We have a packet tracer verifying all of this. So we're gonna go through some of those packet tracers that really uh, dig into the, those concepts, re uh, reiterate them. All right, so moving on. 11.2 mitigating VLAN attacks. So we've already discussed VLAN hopping attacks can be launched in a few different ways. One of the big ones is a end device being able to uh, use either in, uh, DTP or some other function to get a trunk 
port connected to that switch. That way it can be part of the native VLAN on that interface. You can also introduce a rogue switch by, again, allowing trunking to uh, take place. Or you can do uh, double tagging or double encapsulation of a frame to uh, double tag a VLAN. So how do we actually mitigate them? Very straightforward, very simple. Do not allow for auto trunking. You hard code switch port uh, ports to access mode or to a trunk mode. You don't allow for negotiation. You hard code the appropriate VLANs. So again, the big takeaway is disable DTP. Don't allow for auto trunking. Make sure to actually set your ports correctly. And again, uh, looking at the uh, native VLANs, modifying it from the default VLAN. So let's talk about how we mitigate DHCP based attacks. The goal of DHCP starvation is basically to, to gobble up all of the spare addresses in that pool, basically creating a denial of service on that service. Uh, if a person can't get on the network because there's no addresses available, well, that's a denial of service attack. So recall that the ATP starvation attack can be very effectively mitigated by using basic things like port security because the gobblers use unique MAC addresses for each of the DHCP requests. However, mitigating those spoofing attacks require more protection. So with this, we can actually use some of the tools that are built in. One thing that Cisco allows for is basically what's called DHCP snooping and trusted ports. This is the one thing that's normally not turned on uh, for whatever reason. So essentially, DHCP spoofing attacks, uh, again, using uh, DHCP snooping on a trusted port will mitigate those types of attacks. So snooping filters DHCP messages and it rate limits the traffic on untrusted ports. So that means if something uh, is coming up on an access port and it's discontinuously requesting addresses, it can rate limit how many requests can be sent on that port unless it is trusted. So devices under administrative controls like switches, routers, servers, you can declare as trusted. Trusted interfaces like trunks and uh, server ports must be explicitly configured as trusted. You can set all other uh, ports outside of that to be untrusted. And again, you can rate limit how many requests are being asked on those ports. So a DHCP table is built that will include source MAC addresses of devices on an untrusted port and the addresses assigned by the DHCP server. We already know that's how it functions. You have a MAC address and it maps to an IP address. Therefore, this table can be called the DHCP snooping binding table. MAC address that is known and the address that is assigned. So how do we actually implement DHCP snooping? Well, first of all, we enable it globally. We issue the IP DHCP snooping command. On the trusted ports, navigate to the port. You can do IP DHCP snooping trust and uh, that on that interface will allow it to be trusted. On untrusted interfaces, you can also then limit the amount of, uh, limit the, the rate of packets per second for DHCP. And you do that by issuing an IP DHCP snooping limit rate, space the PPS on that interface. And again, you can also do this per VLAN by issuing the IP DHCP snooping VLAN configuration, and that will be done globally as well. So here is the configuration for snooping per interface, for a range of interfaces, and for VLANs. This is trusted, this is untrusted, and we're setting a rate limit, and this is setting it up via our VLANs. And here you can see that this is going to be the trusted port, and this will be the untrusted port. That way, things that are coming this way will be trusted, things that are coming this way will be rate limit. So, 
how can we verify? You can do a show IP DHCP snooping, and that is how we can verify the bindings. Moving forward, we have our ARP attacks. Typical ARP attacks is basically a threat actor can send an unsolicited ARP reply to other hosts when the subnet to try to get their addresses. How do we mitigate this? Well, we can do dynamic ARP inspection, DAI, and this requires DHCP snooping and helps prevent other types of ARP-based attacks. Basically, what ends up happening is it allows not replying to invalid or gratuitous ARP replies uh, to other ports in the same VLAN. It will intercept ARP requests and replies on untrusted ports. It will verify intercepted packets for a valid IP to MAC address binding. It will drop and log ARP replies coming from invalid to prevent poisoning. It will also do error disabling the interface if configured uh, DAA numbers of the ARP packets are exceeded. Now, the disabling uh, that interface is outside the scope of the CCNA. That's just one of the things that can happen. So how do we configure this? Same way that we did the ATP snooping, we do it globally and then on each selected VLAN and then we can also enable dynamic ARP inspection on each VLAN and then lastly we configure trusted interfaces for snooping and ARP inspection. On the untrusted ports here and here we can actually do our ARP inspection. On the trusted port it's going to allow those to come in. So how do we look at that? How do we configure that? Well, we set our trusted port, we set the trusts, and we turn them on per VLAN. And on the non-trusted ports, it will actually do snooping and inspection. Dynamic ARP inspection configuration checks the destination or and the MAC uh, addresses. So it's going to look at both the MAC and IP addresses. It can do based off of destination, source, or IP. So if it's doing it based off the destination MAC, it'll check the destination uh, MAC in the header against the target MAC address in the ARP body. Source MAC, it'll check the source MAC address in the header based off the ARP body. And lastly, it will check the IP of the ARP body for invalid or unexpected IP addresses, including addresses such as multicast addresses, quad zeros or quad 255s, or uh, IP addresses outside the normal range. Normally it's looking for class A, B, C, sometimes D, but uh, any E or F range are thrown out. So again, other uh, configuration, uh, we can do like validation. We can do validate source, validate destination, validate IP. And we do that at the global configuration by issuing an IP ARP inspection validate source, destination, or IP. So it just kind of depends on how we want to do our filtering. Lastly, we're going to talk about mitigating STP-based attacks. We already know about port fast and PPDU, PPDU guard. Well, the nice thing is port fast on edge ports will automatically turn them on and they should be done on edge devices. Port fast immediately brings up a port to a forwarding state, but it bypasses listening and learning states. This allows for end uh, user or end device access. BPDU guard basically guards uh, immediate error disabled on a port that receives a BPDU guard when it shouldn't be. So example, port fast should not be enabled in between switches. It should only be enabled on edge or end device access based ports. So if a switch gets plugged into those ports and a BPDU actually comes through, error disable, and that port's turned off because it was configured to only access end devices and another switch was plugged into it. How do we actually set this up? What we can do is navigate to the interface. We can set spanning tree port fast default and that will allow us to actually set it globally to any of the access ports. We can also set it per interface by doing a spanning tree port fast. And again, it will even tell you it needs to only be configured on ports that are connected to a single host. 
Again, spanning tree port fast default globally turns it on to all access ports, or you can do it based per interface with a spanning tree port fast command. And you can verify by doing a show spanning tree summary or by going to the interface and looking at the details. How do you configure BPDU guard? Very straightforward. Just like we set up spanning tree port fast, we'll do the same thing but with PBDU guard. You can navigate to the interface, spanning tree, BPDU guard, and enable it. Or you can do it globally by issuing the spanning tree port fast BPDU guard and set it to default. And you can verify with a show, summary, or show spanning tree summary just to verify. And that's all we had for this chapter. We have a lab covering ways to secure unused ports, implement port security, mitigate VLAN, DHCP, ARP, and STP based attacks. We have uh, sections covering all of those areas in this uh, PowerPoint. That's what we did. We learned how to do basic security, uh, disabling ports, setting up port security. We looked at setting up and mitigating things to prevent uh, switching attacks and trunking attacks like VLAN hopping. We looked at uh, issues with DTP. We looked at DHCP, how to set up some of the features for DHCP like snooping, trusted ports, and rate limits. And we also looked at, look, uh, at ARP and STP. STP looking at both port fast and setting up our bridge protocol data units and that is it for this chapter if you have any questions or anything please feel free to reach out again with this material being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic again i'm here if you need anything thank you